short moment. Ah, oh, yay. <laughs> oh, hi, Gabrielle. Hi, everyone. Um, I've got you all on mute at the moment, but I would love to take you off mute so we can hopefully have a conversation uh, as we go. But I think my internet will die if I do that. So at the moment, I'll just talk. And if you could type your questions to me uh, in the chat box, that would be really helpful. And then I'll try and take you off mute um, midway through. Let's see how that goes. Let me just make sure I can see that my... All right, we are here to talk about fixed and value pricing on a day when the world feels like it is completely up and down. I hope everyone is okay at the moment. Um, there's obviously a lot of fear and worry, particularly in the business community, about what the coronavirus pandemic will mean for all of us. And um, my only, I guess, comments and pieces of advice in relation to that for all of you who are running practices like me is these are the moments where we have to both remain positive and we have to lead our teams but at the same time, we need to try and create what I'll call a bit of a backup plan. We try and need to anticipate the things that are going to be thrown at us um, and do our very best in those moments, but also remain flexible because it is obviously a thing that is moving so quickly and as such, very, very challenging for all of us in that way. Um, so from my perspective in my business, my practice is Brisbane Family Law Centre. Um, in terms of managing what's happening right now, and I think it's, it's actually very timely that we're going to be talking about fixed and value pricing because the I think focus to the next pricing. And so I think now there's never been a better time to think carefully about how we're charging um, and what that means for our clients. So, If there are any difficulties hearing me, please don't hesitate to just tell me and I will um, do my best to try and fix any of the tech problems that are arising as I go. So most of you would know me. Um, right now, I am here in Brisbane. This is my home office. Uh, I, in my day job, run a law firm called Brisbane Family Law Centre. And as I describe it in my side hustle, I have a business called Happy Lawyer, Happy Life, working with people around Australia and also overseas, focusing on how they can have great businesses and great practices in the law, but also have really, um, hopefully, businesses that enable them to be really happy. And I use the word happy, but really what I'm talking about there is contentment and a sense of wellness and hopefully finding some sense of balance as much as I worry about that word sometimes. Now I can see Stephanie that you're telling me that things are cut out and I can sort of see that in my own video. I'm not sure why that is and if I get off these video slides that could be half the problem. Oh I can see that it's freezing again. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> It's going to be a day of very bad technology, I think, just to make my life tricky. Um, I'll keep going, and if it becomes unbearable, tell me, and what we might do is drop out and try and reconnect and see if that solves our problem. So I started my practice, Brisbane Family Law Centre, 11 years ago now. Uh, I had... Law. This has really been family law for a long time now. Um, I started the practice when I was 30 years of age and I think I had this vision that life would be pretty easy um, in business. I don't know why I had that vision. It was clearly a very incorrect vision. Life is not easy in business. It's incredibly difficult. And it was only a few years into running the firm that I really started to question whether I could continue to run the firm. Um, I found myself looking very much like I do on that slide, really tired, um, constantly in a state of worry 
about running the firm and, and keeping cash flow moving particularly. And it was at that moment that I started to make some pretty big changes in how I ran my business, um, the type of clients that I wanted to work with and the type of lawyer that I wanted to be. See if this makes it any better. Um, so my sort of business life cycle, is that the right way of putting it? Is I start the law firm, I then become a mum, which many of you would be parents, and that added a whole new level of stress to my life when I had my daughter London back in 2012. I was then exhausted, not getting a lot of sleep, questioning whether law was really gonna be a thing that I could keep doing. Um, but I started at about that time a business course, and it was a course that was very focused on there weren't any other lawyers in the course. There was 50 business owners here in Brisbane in this program. Um, I started that business program and it really changed so much of my understanding and learning about business. And this was when one of the first times that certainly I was exposed to online marketing, web marketing, um, fixed pricing, like just the way that businesses that aren't law firms did business. And so at during that course, I started the um, blog and the website, The Happy Family Lawyer, which for me was a real turning point in my business life as a lawyer. Um, I was one of the first in Australia to start a very, I guess, personal blog that connected to the area of law that I practiced in. And this was back in 2013 when blogging was still not really a thing in the business industry. There were a lot of personal blogs in the world, but not a lot, certainly in law. Um, and social media was a very new thing at the time as well in terms of its business use. So for me, as I built my blog and I started to engage on social media platforms, I learned an awful lot about marketing and about how to build a very niche brand. The website, The Happy Family Lawyer, is still my personal blog and my personal brand, but it's a massive driver of business to our firm, Brisbane Family Law Centre. Um, I then wrote the book Splitsville, which is a book around divorce. It, it in essence helps people to understand how they can work their way through separation and divorce themselves and in a perfect world, stay out of the court. And I guess an important thing to know about my practice is the majority of my work is outside of the family law courts. I do an awful lot of collaborative law and mediation and negotiation and work primarily with families that are trying to find solutions in an amicable way. That experience of sort of navigating, finding a way to run my own practice in a positive way, in a way that worked in making all of the changes I did in my business, um, enabled me to become a happier lawyer. And that enabled me ultimately to start the business, Happy Lawyer, Happy Life. That began with the book, Happy Lawyer, Happy Life, How to Be Happy in Law and Life, which is a book I wrote after my own experience of really having to navigate, how can I be a lawyer? Um, run a successful business and maintain happiness because our industry is not known for that and there are lots of challenges that I'm sure we could go off on a tangent and talk about for hours. Um, you would probably know I run a podcast by the same name and I've been running that podcast for three years and I can see some of the people on the call have been amazing guests on my podcast over the years and of course now I do a lot of work with lawyers around the country and overseas helping them navigate um, how they can also run successful businesses and maintain happiness. So I'm telling you all of this to give you some context to how it is that I'm talking to you today about fixed pricing. Um, I now run these sort of four core businesses, obviously BFLC, Brisbane Family Law Centre, which is a pure fixed fee value pricing, no timesheets practice. We have Amicably, which is our online legal solution. So that's something that um, is this far from being launched. We've been in the testing phase for the last six months. What Amicably enables people to do is navigate divorce and separation purely online um, and ultimately complete documents such as consent orders, parenting plans and the like. Um, and the product itself generates documents for people. <clears throat> and then of course, Happy Lawyer, Happy Life and the club, which is a membership product that sits within that. I tell you all of that because one of the things that hopefully will become apparent today is once you move into a fixed and value pricing mindset, it enables you to think very differently about the service offering or the products as I call them that, that exist within your business. And it enables you to think about different ways that you can generate income, different ways that you can serve your clients because you're moving away from a time for money model.
Good morning, Santoshi. So if everyone can just tell me if they can now hear me, I can see that my screen has stopped jumping. So I'm hoping it's a lot clearer um, and you can now, great, thank you so much, Emma. You can now hear me. So let's get stuck into this. I'm gonna share with you today sort of five key tips or five key learnings that I um, have come to understand and know as a result of implementing fixed and value pricing in our practice. I'm very happy to answer as many questions as you would like um, as we go. The only caveat I'll give you all is that I am technically meant to be in the children's court at 9 a.m. this morning after receiving a call very late yesterday. <laughs> so I will be jumping off this webinar um, at a quarter to nine to race my way <laughs> into the city, life of a lawyer as it is. But aside from that, I'm here and please ask questions as we go. Now I can see that someone raised a hand and if only I knew how to deal with that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> but I cannot see where that is in Zoom. Emma Houston, if you are the tech wizard watching and you know how to help me find that person and whatever they were trying to ask me, please feel free to tell me. I cannot find it. That's just crazy. Anyway, so with fixed and value pricing, we made the shift at Brisbane Family Law Centre uh, around about four years ago to move um, away from time-based billing and just move to fixed pricing. When I first made that move, we did it, I guess I'd call it a little bit half in, half out. I wasn't really certain how to do this. I had spent some time with a colleague of mine, Matthew Burgess, that some of you might know. He runs a firm here in Brisbane, View Legal. His firm is purely fixed value pricing. So I was learning a little bit from Matthew. He's one of the early episodes in my podcast. He's very knowledgeable in this space. Um, and I, I really just didn't know where to start. So the first activity we did was picked things that we knew we could easily predict the pricing for. So in family law, they were things like divorce applications, which many of you probably already do under some form of fixed pricing regime. We did the same with consent orders, consent orders where people had reached an agreement and we knew it was just the drafting stage. That was an easy space for us to go, okay, we, we can predict that work. It's less risky. Let's, let's fix price those things. Um, and then I started to work out how can I fix price other parts of our practice? And I got one of my solicitors to go back through the data in my business and put the previous files in essence into boxes and say anything that was a mediation how long did the file last for and what was the penultimate fee um, and similarly with say collaborative practice with litigation we went through our whole practice and just put a whole bundle of previous files into different categories so that we could get a sense of well how much were we charging for these different things how much did they cost what was the length of time involved and what was the impact of different clients? You know, clients that are really savvy and organized and give you information versus clients that are the other end of that spectrum. Or what was the impact of colleagues? Some colleagues who are perhaps more difficult to work with than others. What did that mean to the fees? And so this is why tip number one for me is um, data is your friend. When it comes to making this shift from time-based billing to fixed pricing, it is such a mindset shift and you're going to feel incredibly uncomfortable when you're trying to come up with a price for things. And so a place that I found a lot of comfort was first doing a data analysis of the data that existed in my business. And at this point in time, I had six or seven or probably even eight years worth of data that I could go right back through and really think about, well, how much did we charge? What if it was that lawyer versus this lawyer? What if it was this person working on a file working versus that person working on a file? And it gave us some anchor points when it came to first starting to scope new things. We had some idea of, under the old way, this is what a file like this might look like and this is what a file like this might cost. So I would encourage you, if you're thinking about making this shift, how about you go back through even the last 12 months of business data, look at files that have been closed and finished and just do an analysis of what was the total fees charged for each of those things. Has anyone done that? I'd love to know in the chat, has anyone done that sort of tracking and data exercise for their existing work? My neighbors are renovating. That's just gonna to add to the morning's delight. <laughs> noise in the background. Apologies if that's um, just adding to your joy at the other end of this call right now. 
So Helen, you do this periodically. Yeah, it's actually really helpful data. I didn't do this. Um, yeah, it was all over the place, Gabrielle. And isn't that interesting that there's like sometimes no consistency. And this is something interesting about time recording. We sort of think that by time recording, we're tracking everything. And so we've got this really great data. Some information I um, heard last week, I went to a, a lunch and learn session run by the tech company Smokeball. They're a practice management system. And their stats, I'll get this wrong, but their stats were something like the actual time recorded versus the actual time spent is like half. And so there's this perception with time recording that it's, you know, we're capturing everything. So it's a really accurate way of doing things. But the general theme is that we really don't um, do that. Now, just scroll up and read the rest of these comments. Thank you so much, guys. Ah, uh, yeah, so you don't have closed files, Kerry, as such, but you've on advice, advice on going. Yeah, difference between, say, divorce, obviously, which hopefully people finish that and don't come back and the space that you're in. You could still do the same data exercise. Look, though, maybe at periods. You know, what is it like over a quarter, over a year? Like, look at the different periods of time in your business and really pull this data because it's going to make a really big difference to the decisions that you're able to make um, for your business moving forward. Yeah, so um, lots of people tracking their time. Yes, yes. Commercial matters, there's a ceiling on fees. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay, the other piece of data that I would really encourage you to know, and it's going to be super important in the coming months, is how much it costs you to open your doors of your law firm each and every week right down to the dollar. So I know the exact number. I've looked at it over 12 months and then I've brought it right back to a week. So I know the exact number that it costs me to open my firm every single week. And what that does is it gives me a really important target when it comes to ensuring that the business is financially viable. How do you find that number? Well, again, you need some data. So Claire Jennings, you're just mentioning to me that you're a reasonably new business, so you don't have access to a lot of data and, and that is tricky. Um, but I think you can make a series of assumptions that will enable you to do the exercise I was talking about with client files, but also the exercise I'm talking about now in terms of understanding your overarching business numbers. So I really encourage you to sit down with those terrible things that most of us hate, your profit and loss, your balance sheets, your zero files, whatever accounting thing you're using. And if you don't understand them, then find your bookkeeper or accountant and get them to sit with you. Book in a call with me and we'll work our way through. But what we want to be able to do is work out right down to almost a day. How much does it cost me to keep the doors of my law firm open and function in a really useful way? Why do you think that number matters? Does anyone know? <laughs> why that number matters so much, particularly if we're going to move to fixed pricing. I have to pause because there's clearly a delay between my conversation and your answers. Why does that number matter? Yep, there you go. Yep, <laughs> so Emma's saying you need to make sure you cover those costs and you know make money on top if that's what you're trying to do. Um, Angela's saying, so you know how many of each file you need to finish. Exactly. Like once you've got this metric, your whole business can work around these numbers. If you can't make that number, no amount of fixed amounts are going to happen. Exactly, Ali. So the way it works in our firm is the number that I have for my business includes the amount on top, if I could call it that, Emma. So it includes the buffer. Like I know that as long as I'm hitting that number, Everyone gets paid. I can do all of the marketing I want to do. I've um, included in it things like if I needed to do projects such as build the website uh, and a savings amount, which is really important to me to try and have some buffer for circumstances like we're all about to deal with over the coming weeks. So that number, it then enables my team to track and ensure that the income coming into the business, so make sure you're really clear about the difference between the income coming in, so the amounts received versus the bills sent. I'm not interested in the bills sent, I'm interested in the amounts received. There's no point sending a bill for $50,000 if you never get paid for it. I don't want that in my numbers. All I want is the money coming into the general account. Um, so we track 
on a weekly basis and we track on a firm target. We don't have individual targets. So it doesn't matter who's doing the work in the sense of, oh, well, that person build this much and that person build this much. We don't operate like that. We operate a full team uh, number and we have a whiteboard where it's tracked on a daily basis. So we're really able to, in a very micro sense, watch and manage and ensure that the business cash flow and the business income is really considered. Um, and hopefully, if we can identify challenges, we can quickly fix them because we can see them right there, right in front of us, big whiteboard tracked really cleverly. So this data is your friend. Whether you're doing fixed pricing, time-based billing, I would say to you, data is your friend in business. The more you know your numbers, the more you know um, the average sort of revenue that comes from a file, then the more you're going to be able to go, okay, well, if I have 20 of those types of files over the space of six months, that past shows me is going to be enough to meet the numbers that I have now. And it enables you to build your whole marketing strategy around that and your whole business strategy. So the more you can get clear on the data and the numbers in your business, the easier a shift to fixed and value pricing will be. But even if you choose not to make this shift, the better your business will be right now. One of the challenges with time-based billing is in a, in a simplistic sense, your business revenue is capped. It's capped at the maximum number of hours that you can get your fee earning solicitors to be sitting at their desks doing billable work. And so if that maximum number of hours is, let's say it was 12 billable hours a day, they'd probably have to work 24 to get to 12 in all honesty, but it's some silly number like that then that's the maximum revenue that your business could earn this year because you are purely relying upon person, hours, invoice. In my business, we don't have person, hours, invoice. We have creativity and products. So we look at our business and say, okay, what can we build that we just invest in once? And once we've invested in that IP, we could sell it to multiple people. Or alternatively, what is a step in this process that we do every single time? Uh, could we record a webinar just like I am now that delivers that information to our clients and takes that piece out um, of the workflow that we need to do for that type of file? So let me give you an example of that. In um, family law, we do a lot of work in mediation. And so preparing for mediation is a process that is pretty um, consistent every time you do it. There'll be data that you need to have, there'll be information that you need to share with your client in the sense of the advice and outcome, and then there'll be the mediation itself. And something that we've built is a series of online resources, very much like this webinar that I'm delivering today, so that we can prepare our clients for events like mediation. So they can sit and watch in their own time, me talk to them about what it's like to prepare for mediation, what they can expect on the day, what they need to bring, what they need to do. And what that hopefully does um, is saves me having that one hour conversation with every single one of our clients, but it also lets them have that information at a time that probably works better for them when they can really think about it. They can watch and listen, it, listen to it multiple times if they wish to. And what we've found is that when we deliver information like this to our clients and then they come back to us, the telephone conversation or the meeting that we have with them, the time involved is cut right down. Um, and they're asking much better questions of us because they're much more informed about the step and the process. And then they're able to have a much better conversation around, okay, this is my mediation. These were the things that I wasn't sure about. What does this mean? What does that mean? Um, and it just then takes the fear for them out, makes them more relaxed and enables them to negotiate so much better. We've done that for all different parts of our practice, family reports, collaborative practice, negotiation, understanding property pools. Like there's all of these things that we do all of the time. And we pause in my office and think like, if this is something I have to do for this person, I'm probably gonna to have to do it for another person. So how about I record it so I can deliver it in a more time and cost effective way. Just an example of once you move away from time-based billing into fixed price billing, it encourages your mind to think differently. You are now focused on efficiency rather than, oh, well, I just keep doing this thing and I keep charging that time. Yeah, so it is such a value add, Angela. And um, it, it just, I think it really helps clients 
the more information that we can give them in, in different ways, you know, we all learn differently. If we go back to university or if we went to the College of Law and did our masters, you see all the different ways that information is provided to students now. You know, there's lots of readings, there's visual displays, there's videos to watch. Because as human beings, we all take on information differently. And for most of us in law, the clients that we're dealing with are so deeply stressed, that their ability to process information at the best of times is already compromised. And so if we can genuinely think about how do we provide that information and how can we do it usefully it's going to really change their experience with us but also free up your time and the more you can free up the time your time a couple of things technically I guess the more work you can do and if that's that's you know if you're super busy and you want to do more work then great for you my focus is trying to ensure that my team are working from 8 30 to 5 and not earlier and not later so looking for efficiencies that enable our business to rock make the money it needs to make but everyone to have a life. That's what I am so focused on. So everything for me comes back to how do I ensure that I have a life? How do I ensure that my team have a life? Overwork is a massive problem in our industry. So for me, that's what's driving all of these little innovations that we're building in our business. I'm just trying to make this slide jump forward. And of course it doesn't want to, because that would just be my life. All right. Let's just talk a little bit about pricing. So tip number two, mistake we made. When we first started fixed and value pricing, we had like a menu. It was like you went to a restaurant and there was consent orders, mediation, collaborative practice, starting court process, and the price was the same. And that was a massive failing on my behalf. I don't now have a menu. The price is different for almost every client. And this is a really important thing to think about. When we're really here talking about value pricing rather than fixed pricing. Conveyancing is a great example of fixed pricing in the legal market. You know, the bottom fell out of conveyancing a really long time ago. And so conveyancing is a fight to the bottom, sadly. Um, prices are very low when it comes to buying and selling property. Uh, and usually, sadly, clients are actually price shopping in that space because it's just, oh, well, I just need some documents done and hey, presto, if you're $400 and you're $600, I'm probably going to choose the $400 person because the customer service experience element of this is about zero. So we don't want to be that. We want to be able to price and really value the work that we're doing and the many, many thousands of dollars and years that we have invested in ourselves to be able to deliver the work that we do. If you think about time-based billing here, if you're someone like me, um, many of you are accredited specialists in the area that you work in or just specialists in the area that you work in with 20 years of work experience, there's every chance that you're going to be able to answer a legal question for a client far quicker than someone who is just starting out. And if you're on a time-based billing model, then arguably you're missing incredible value because it's that years and years of experience and knowledge that might enable you to go, there's the answer. Whereas someone else might spend many hours researching, thinking, doing calculations, working stuff out. Do not underestimate the importance of that learned and lived experience when it comes to the work that you're doing and particularly when it comes to pricing. Now, let me be clear, I'm not advocating overcharging, but I'm advocating genuinely thinking about the value that you're bringing to the piece of work that you're delivering. So once we learned that it wasn't as simple as saying everyone that gets a consent order, here's the price, and we tossed that out the window, we went back to working out, well, what does it mean for this person? What is the value to them? Who is doing the piece of work? Is it me, the owner of the business? Is it Kiara, my first year lawyer? What does that mean in terms of pricing? Sometimes it means nothing. Sometimes it means everything. Um, What's the urgency of this piece of work? Is it a situation where someone's come to you on Friday afternoon and they're in court on Monday morning and you've said, yes, I'll do that piece of work. And so now what's happened is your whole weekend is upside down because you're preparing for that thing on Monday. If you did that to me, if a client did that to me, and if I chose to take that piece of work on, the price would be different than someone who'd come to see me weeks earlier and I had plenty of time to prepare appropriately for that that particular court event. So really pausing and thinking about what is this piece of work? Who is the client? Are they organized? Are they efficient? Are they easy to deal with? Are they deeply difficult to deal with? Who's the solicitor acting on the other side? Is that going to make this easy? Is that going to make this difficult? Do I not know yet? Like just really think about what is this piece of work? What is it going to look like? And have a very clear strategy about the steps that you're going to take. This is where value pricing 
really can be powerful. Uh, if you get very clear on what is the value that you're delivering to your client, um, your pricing structure can completely change as a result. If there's any questions about that before I move on, please toss them in the comments now. I can see, Emma, you've said that you took your menu down recently. I was just looking at one of Emma Houston's um, quotes yesterday because she's about to do some work for me in terms of a trademark. And it was just the most beautifully done quote. Um, it was so easy to read and like just so simply done. And it was a fixed price quote. So Emma, I will ring you later today, hopefully to sort that out to action that. Um, but just so well done. And, it, you know, from a client perspective, when someone sends you a proposal that just is easy to read, it's visually done it's in plain language and this is the price and it's set out really clearly for me this is also um, the cost that won't be included you know these are the ones that are it just makes it so much easier for me as the client to go yes done happy to do that rather than I guess a more standard quote that comes from lawyers which can be look yes happy to help you with um, in my case the trademarks but the quote could be any it might cost you anywhere from here to here depending on what you choose to do and depending on how long it takes and blah 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 and that just makes me anxious already I want to be able to go that's how much it costs budget for that thanks very much problem solved and I think our clients really want that as well um, so number three, please throw questions as we go. I'm, I'm reading that chat box, but I'll keep talking. Number three, it is all about the scope. So for fixed and value pricing to work in your practice, you genuinely need to spend a lot of time thinking about the steps in the piece of work that you're doing. And I'm going to show you two examples of quotes um, or fixed price quotes that we have. Um, Ali just asked me a question. I'll just pause and answer that. Do you essentially provide a lower price for people who need it more, bearing in mind the other factors? Um, just making sure I understand that question, Ali. I apologise. Lower price for people who need it more. Um, I don't charge a lower or higher price in that sense. I also try and work with the budget of the client. So one of the questions I do ask my clients is, what is your budget for this piece of work? Uh, and get a sense of what that is for them. So I'm not sure whether that helps with that question in the sense of a lower or a higher price. I do charge, if I've got a, um, here we are, a, an employment contract for a sole trailer versus a media side business. Yeah, I would. I would absolutely look at that and say, you know, this person is less likely to have the resources of this person. And this piece of work is less complex than this piece of work. And so the price will be different. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think with commercial work too, the advantage you have over, say, me as a divorce practice is your clients hopefully will become lifetime clients. And so I think it can be really important to think about the customer journey that a newer business or smaller business is going on because if you can form that relationship early on and then live with them, build them along the way, that's going to be incredibly powerful for your business in terms of that um, obviously continued work with that person. But I absolutely would sit down and think, you know what, what is the, the business and the client? What is their budget? How do I work with that? Um, so that I can still offer value to that person for the budget that they have, rather than just saying, here's the piece of work, that's the price, too bad if you can't do it. I think this is going to be really important for us in the coming months when the business community is about to really struggle because of what's happening around the world. I think we are going to have to have very honest conversations with our clients and say genuinely, what can you afford right now? What's your cash flow right now? What can you do? Because I need to stay in business and you need to stay in business. So let's work together on this and just be sensible and practical. Um, an example for me is I do a lot of what I call coaching now with, with clients in the divorce space where I'm sort of in the back end helping them doing um, advice in the sense of they'll call me and they'll say, can you read this email? Do you think that looks appropriate? Can I send that? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and so that coaching is really powerful way for people to remain in control of their own negotiations. And also to manage the cost of that because it's a much lower price point than having a, a, you know, a lawyer, I guess, on an hourly rate doing stuff and you don't necessarily know until after the event what they've done. We do our coaching on retainer models. And Tessa, this feeds into the question you're asking me, do I do different levels of pricing? Yes, I do. So we have um, usually a gold, silver, bronze model for pricing as much as we can. So we look at it and say, um, how I, I call the gold sort of model like the Louis Vuitton um, option. If you had all of the budget in the world, 
if you had all of the resources in the world and if you could offer the highest level of service to that client, what would that look like and what would the price be? Right down to a um, silver, you know, gold, silver, bronze, the bronze model, I call it more the DIY model. As much as possible, the client's doing the majority of the heavy lifting and I'm sort of sitting there overseeing it. What's the price of that? And then, of course, the silver sits in the middle. There's lots of um, psych psychology in the Vera Sage model that you're talking about there, Tessa. There's lots of information in that space around the fact that as human beings, we often will pick the middle or the highest and rarely the lowest. But by giving clients choice, the beauty in that, again, is they feel empowered. It's their decision. They can choose what level of involvement they have with your organisation. And I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, it's particularly powerful when it comes to risk management. The more choice you give your client, the less likely they are to complain about things because it was ultimately their choice. But this is where that scope becomes really, really important. Being very, very clear about what is included in the bronze level model and what's not. What is included in the silver level model and what's not. And what's included in what I call the Louis Vuitton model and what's not. The other thing about scoping is thinking about all the different steps. One of the mistakes we made early on is we were doing really small scopes because we were anxious. We were like, oh, we don't know where this family law file is going. So we'll just scope you to send one letter um, see what the response is, and then we'll do the next bit. And we found that our clients hated that because it was a bit, again, like the bill shock that they get when it comes to time-based billing, where the bill's sent and they say, well, hang on, I didn't know it was going to be $4,000. I've got $2,000 in trust. I assumed that's what it would be. And you, of course, say, oh, yes, but I had to do all this work. And, you know, that's the price. And we have found that by scoping as many steps as possible, and having steps that it, it becomes a bit like one of those um, choose your own adventure sort of mind map situations where it's like it goes here and then it could be this. If yes, then this. If no, then that. And then here and then here and then here. That project management style of thinking takes hours, but it is so valuable because the more you can project manage out a file and genuinely think in my world, about the settlement aspects of a file, um, give the client as much information up front, then again, they get to choose their path. And they know the consequence if we can't achieve this over here and it ends up over here, this is the cost associated with that. And so again, they're in the box seat as they make decisions about how their matter moves forward. This is really, really important stuff for them. Um, yeah, so really think about the scopes and the steps and the stages. A good example, I think, that takes out of lawland that might help with this idea of scoping. I, my husband and I renovated our house um, two years ago and we had a fixed price contract with our builder. He was awesome, but it took him three weeks to give us the quote. I was like, why is this taking so long? Three weeks is really not that long. But the reason it took so long is the quote itself and the detail in it went for about 10 pages. Here are all of the different micro elements of what's involved in this build. Like it took him hours, I suspect, to quote that building and give me that fixed price. As we were then renovating and as we're building and there were, you know, different things that arose and I had Clarissa moments where I was like, I want to add skylights and I want to do this and I want to do that, he would issue a variation. So the variation, um, same sort of thing in Lawland here where we issue a separate scope. So this thing's happened that wasn't in the original scope, that wasn't expected, here is the cost of that. If you want to deal with that, this is what it looks like and this is what it costs. If you want to install those skylights, Clarissa, you can. This is the cost of that extra piece of work. And again, that's the most helpful way I've found of communicating with my clients. We don't just send them a thing and say, sorry, it's costing you more. You pick up the phone and say, this um, unexpected thing is happening. They'll know because they've also, you know, read the email, seen the difficult thing, whatever it is. This unexpected thing is happening. I'm now going to send you a new scope for that separate piece of work. The existing scope stays, or sometimes the existing scope completely shifts because someone's commenced proceedings, which you really weren't expecting, um, or someone's filed some unusual application in the proceedings that you were in. And so you just keep, you know, keeping your client informed, sending them additional scopes so that they're really alive to what's going on and hopefully they feel completely in control of that process. Um, again, please ask questions as we go. So Stephanie, you're saying, how do I factor in what's included in the different levels for the retainer model? Is it hours based? And if they hit the target, they need to pay more. My retainers are not hours based. I'm going to show you a retainer example in a minute. Um, and hopefully that will answer that question for you, Stephanie. But no, we don't do anything that's hour based. Because the minute you're doing that, you're recording time. And this is a great segue into my next point. Um, mistake number four and my tip to you number four, if you're making the shift to fixed and value pricing, you must toss the timesheets. The early mistake we made was that my solicitors were still recording time the old way 
and yet we were quoting the new way. And so, of course, what they were doing the whole time was this mental comparison. If it was the old way, it wouldn't have cost as much or it would have cost more. And this really became a massive problem for me in my business. When one of my younger team members did a piece of work, we had quoted, it wasn't a massive amount of money from memory, but from memory, it was about $1,000 for this piece of work. She did that piece of work really efficiently. And so she decided and emailed the client and said, I'm only trying to charge you $500 for that piece of work. And I had to have a really difficult conversation with her where I said something on the lines of, are you content for me to just reduce your salary each week on the premise of me going, oh, well, I feel like you didn't have to work as hard this week, so I'll just pay you a bit less because that's all we need to do here. Um, the whole point with fixed and value pricing is that you set the price, you agree the price, and then the more efficient your business can be, the better. You don't then want to be discounting. And so the problem with the time-based comparison was she looked at it and said, well, that was only so many units. So, oh gosh, I shouldn't be doing that. But again, part of, as I said before, why there was only so many units was because of the systems and structures and technology that I'd built in our practice that enabled us to deliver that really effectively. So I really encourage you that if you're going to make this shift, you're really going to have to think about tossing the timesheets so that you stop the mental comparison between the old way and the new way, because it'll create two levels of problems. The first level of problem will be sometimes your retainer, um, fixed fee retainer will be less than the time-based billing. And that'll make you start to go, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I'm losing money. The other side is the example I gave a minute ago where sometimes um, the amount you've quoted is, is really great and you've done the work really efficiently and that's perfect in business. And if the client agreed to that and if you're being ethical and appropriate, there's no problem with that. It's the efficiency that enables you to deliver that work very quickly. Um, and appropriately for people. How do you know if the scope is reached if you're not recording anything? Yeah, so there you go, Kate. So remember that first business metric that I told you about? So you are recording, you're recording the work that you're doing, like the specifics again, and I'll show you an example in our scope. So we do these steps, we do these things, not we spend so many hours. So we send a proposal, we receive a proposal, we have a meeting with you, we send you a draft of the consent orders, we make amendments to the consent order. So it's the action steps. And so it's like a checklist. And so the beautiful thing about that too, is once you've done that, you run a team, Kate, so you can give that checklist of here's the steps on this file. That's the quote that we gave the client. This is what we said we're doing. Tick, 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 tick. And we bill in intervals that are related to those actions. So a simple example is consent orders. A billing process in our file will be, this is the cost of the work and it'll be billed over four separate steps. Step one will be draft document provided to client. Step two will be amendments back from client. Step three will be filing of documents. Step four will be consent orders back and implemented. And so it's broken down into those action steps, not in numbers of hours. And so you need to pause and really think about what are the steps that this piece of work requires. And I think, Stephanie, your question I'll answer in terms of the retainer in a few minutes. All right. Number five, it's a whole of business shift. This is really important to think about here. When you move from time to fixed base billing, you are completely changing how you measure success in your business. Lawyers work really well with billable hours. We've all done it. It's a comfort level. We hate it but we love it. We love it because it enables us to go today. My target was 4.5. I hit 4.5. I'm a winner. Yippee for me. Great. But what we lawyers, when we're particularly employed solicitors, fail to see sometimes is I did my four point hours, but the amount that was recovered was actually 2.2 hours. And that's the bit that matters to the business. And so this time-based billing metric is sadly a little bit of a furphy when it comes to the actual productivity and the actual profit of your business. The number that matters to me, as I said very early in this webinar, is the amount that I'm receiving from clients for their bills. I'm uninterested in the out bills. I'm interested in the in. We do everything money and trust. We don't do work without money and trust. So for me, the bills going out are really relevant because I know I've got that money and trust and I know that I'm going to be able to transfer it in the coming days. And so it's a beautiful metric, really simple metric. I really do encourage you to have a trust account and manage your stages and scopes, money and trust, here it is, this is how it works, we do this and then this money comes through. That, From a cash flow perspective, that's incredibly powerful. I don't do speculative work. I know some people do in family law, I don't. I find that um, it's just something for my business that I've chosen not to do. Um, so when it comes to thinking about this shift, you're gonna to have to think about what are the metrics of success? 
So I mentioned earlier, we have a um, firm wide billing target. We don't have individual targets. It's tracked uh, in a very honest, open way on a whiteboard in our main office. So everyone in the firm can see these are the amounts that have come in. This is our target for the week. And I have to say to you that once I've made that very um, transparent, it really shifted in the business. But that will only work if you've got a team of players that are all on the same page and that are all helping each other. If you've got one person that's sort of there going, oh, well, the others are all working hard and I can just chill over here. It, that system is going to be really, really difficult to be successful with and you'll start to have lots of infighting with people going, that person's not working, I'm working harder, I can prove it to you, whatever it is. So I really want a culture that is a team. I want everyone helping everyone. We look at our workflow, we look at who's got capacity and we just move things around accordingly. We also look at who is the best person to do that piece of work. High level tech work, Clarissa. Lower level organisation of information, one of my law students or paralegals. So really thinking about who is the best person to do the pieces of work that we need to do and sharing that around. Um, now, Matthew, in terms of you and litigation and time recording and cost of files, um, I'm yet to find myself in a situation where a costs order has been an issue and the costing of files has been an issue. But my thought process on this is it would be no different than in any other matter where depending on how your cost order and your cost of litigation is being factored. So is it a scale issue? Is it a someone, you know, is going off to a cost assessor and they're working their way through at which point they'll look at your retainer and look at your fees. And um, if it's a fixed fee, I would have thought they'd just go, well, that's what it was. And there it is. Uh, I don't think it's anything different. So it's, it is again, the scale that people are using to do those cost assessments that will play in. Um, it's not about the time, it's about the product and the outcome that becomes really, really relevant here. I'm very happy offline to answer more specific questions about that if you would like, but I must say, as I said, I haven't found myself yet in a situation where I've had to look at it from a cost order perspective. And most of those in the family law system are one of two things, usually um, scale, which is much less than most of us charge on anything. Uh, and then an indemnity cost order would be the actual fees charged. And my ultimate fees, particularly in litigation, are largely no different or probably less, to be honest, than most of the um, other firms playing in that space. But I really don't do a lot of litigation. And so that issue hasn't arisen for me um, in any significant way. Just coming back to my chat box. All right. What I want to show you now, guys, um, and hopefully I can make this work, is some examples. So I've just got to flip out of this share screen which will be dangerous because we had so many problems getting this to work a minute ago. Okay, let me get rid of that for a second. Slideshow. Um, sorry, just going to pull up a, hopefully, um, just different slide screen so I can show you a retainer example. Now, hopefully you can see this. This um, is a cost proposal that would be sent in our office and it's for a retainer matter. Um, so, first page, kind to see also how this is a colourful kind document, very different to I think certainly the way I used to send um, cost agreements and the like. We send separately. With this, we send a cost agreement, which is a different document, but this is the scoping document. Um, shows people obviously who's working on the matter and who we are, um, the balance of my team and their different different roles. And, uh, you know, visually, this is really important to me that people understand the whole of my team and who they are and where they play in. So this is a fortnightly retainer proposal. Um, just simple English here sets out what layer this particular retainer is. So you can see here, all email communications between them and us, two telephone calls per fortnight. So no time on those, just two telephone calls and one meeting per month if required. And you can see there the price of this particular retainer per fortnight. So that's a really common example of a retainer in our office. And we just change that level of service and then that price accordingly. So it might go up slightly, it might go down slightly, depending on the level of service that a person is hoping. Um, to have with us. And we'll discuss that with them. What, what do they need? What do they want? Uh, you can see how we will bill this. Um, fixed fee, we bill it weekly. Uh, and then it tells them ultimately what is not included in that. Um, 
And then we also put with those retainers because commonly our clients use these at the beginning of matters when they're just not quite certain yet what they're going to do next. We give them an idea here of, okay, here's some other steps that are common in these processes. And these are the prices that we would generally charge for these different steps. So that from the outset, the client has got a sense of, okay, where am I going with my family law matter? And what might different things cost? So this is just a bit like a, um, you know, just a cost estimate for want of a better way of putting it, but a guide so that they can think about, okay, as I think about mediation, what's that going to cost me? As I think about sending some proposals and doing some advice, what's that going to cost me? Like all of these different things. These numbers would change depending on the complexity of a file. Um, so they would go up or down again as we send this out to our different clients. Um, some information there about what a fixed fee even is and how that works. And again, that is in really plain English, which is really important to me that my communications with my clients are plain English. When this is sent, it's sent by Hannah of my office and she is, um, for want of a better word, a client engagement officer. So she sends all of this out and in the email that she sends, she includes a link for that person to make an appointment to talk with her through this document. If she doesn't receive a response from them, she'll follow them up with a phone call just saying, hi, can we help you? Does this all make sense? And it's, it, it is, you know, so interesting how, for how many people these fee proposals are still confusing. And by having an opportunity to talk with Hannah, um, we then get a sense of, okay, what are their concerns? And we can issue a separate or different fee proposal if we've missed something. Um, but also it just enables them hopefully to have comfort about what we're doing and how it works for them. And then you can see the information there about what they need to do, which is pop money in trust, sign this document, send it back. And as I said, this would go with a cost agreement. So that's an example of a retainer. And I'll just bring up an example of, um, this is a more detailed fee proposal that we have done for a um, arbitration matter. Same thing, I'll just try and get this to work, okay. So same beginning, same beginning, same beginning, you know, who are we? And then you can see the difference here. So this is a much more complicated scope and it's got the steps that were involved as we led into the arbitration, the documents that had to be filed, if there was a hearing, all of these things. Um, this is from one of my files that I did last year. And interestingly, step one was needed, step two was needed, step three was needed, step four was needed, step five was needed, step six wasn't. There wasn't a hearing, it was done on the papers. Step seven was, step eight was. And so by breaking these down into these steps, it makes it really easy to go, okay, well, we don't need that piece. We don't have to charge you for that piece, but we do need all of these other pieces. Um, and it's just that flow chart again for clients around, okay, this is what I'm doing. Here are the steps involved. This was a very large quote. All of these different steps um, had to be priced out. So I guess it would be the same as pricing a piece of litigation, you know, preparing the affidavits, preparing um, expert evidence, reviewing the evidence that was filed by the other person, and then ultimately me um, filing an affidavit in reply if that became necessary. This was another piece actually that didn't become necessary, the affidavit in reply. This one did, the, the written submissions in the minute of order. Um, there was a lot of work that went into that. As I said before, the arbitration hearing wasn't necessary, so that was taken out. The advice on outcome, uh, and the registration of the matter and the different steps in that registration again if it was necessary to attend court or not. So you can see the breakdown in how that works. We then included the different billing time frames. So you can see how all of those amounts are spread out. That's really important for your cash flow in your business. Like genuinely think, how do I step this out? We don't want to do a, a quote, this quote's for the best part of $18,000 and not get paid till the very, very end. So we do step and step and step. That's also important because if this matter settles at the end of step three, it's really clear which pieces of work you've done because they've been done and they've been charged along the way. So this micro thinking around the steps is really, really important. Um, and then the same ending as last time, the same information there about the amount that they need to put in trust and what their steps are from there. So that's um, an example of a much more detailed arbitration uh, um, example in terms of my fixed pricing. Now guys, I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm gonna to have to race <laughs> and get myself into court because that's how I like to spend my morning <laughs> in the children's court. Um, but in any event, let me finish this off so that I can do that.
So I've given you some examples. I've got some other resources that you might find helpful. So I do have fixed pricing packs on my website that you can purchase that include um, lots of different examples of the retainers that we've been using. Now, obviously I'm a family law firm, so those will be quite family law focused examples, but examples very like what you've seen there. Those packs also have in them the ability to attend my workshops. So as the world is upside down, of course, now, um, my physical workshops for the coming months won't be happening in person, but what I will be doing is delivering all of my training online. So I'll be starting a four week online fixed pricing workshop. So the one that I would usually run in a full day in person, I'm gonna spread out into a four week online program starting from Friday the 3rd of April. That is intended to give you much more data on the micro steps it will take to implement that sort of pricing into your business. And in some ways I'm excited to run this over a four week period because hopefully that will also give anyone doing that program the opportunity to pick my brain as they try different things and I can review things. And I guess the difference when you're doing things in one day is you don't get that chance. So I'm hoping that that um, is actually more helpful to, to those of you that are coming and doing these programs so that you have a better chance to really learn how to do things and hopefully can learn from the many mistakes that I've made along the way, of which there have been many, uh, when it comes to fixed and value pricing. So team, that was largely what I wanted to share with you this morning. I'm hoping um, that that has been helpful in terms of an overview of some of the learnings and things that we've done that have worked well and some of the things that haven't worked as well and why you should avoid them. I've got a challenge for you today. What I'd love you to do today, tomorrow, this week, whilst you're creating your remote work from home plans is have a go at creating a fixed pricing scope for a piece of work. Just have a go. And it's so interesting when you sit and think, okay, what are the steps that I take on this type of work? Break them down, draw a picture, really think about it. And then think genuinely about the costs involved. You could go, as I said at the very beginning, back through your business data and do a bit of an analysis and see what's there. But I really encourage you to have a go, give it a whirl, see what you can do. Now, because life's amazing, um, I cannot pull up right now <laughs> the chat box to enable me to answer any of your questions, which is deeply unhelpful. I'm just see if I, ha, ah, here we are. <laughs> All right, guys. So um, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that was helpful. Email me any questions because I have to race because <laughs> I've really tied myself tight this morning. Um, email me any questions that you have. My email's clarissa at bflc.com.au. Uh, you can find the resources, as I said, on my website. I'll email that out to you and also the fixed pricing program. The world is upside down. Please look after yourselves. You know, it's like anything in life. We're all going to get through this one way or another, but the next few weeks are going to be pretty tricky. I think it is the perfect time to experiment with different types of pricing, to be really honest with your customers and clients and ask them, what's your budget? What are your needs right now? What can I do that adds the most value to you without creating havoc in your life? We have to be real because it's going to be important for us in business as well. Happy Tuesday. Have a great day. Thank you so much. See you later.